Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. You can? Can you hear me in the back? Great. Thumbs up. That's a lot of thumbs up. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm a fan of thumbs up, so that was really exciting. Um, great to have so many folks here. If you're coming in and there's not, it's hard to find seats, there's a few more that are over here in the stack. So if you need an extra seat, come over here um, where Julie is. There's extra seats there, a few more left. It's pretty awesome to have a reading where all the seats are taken. Uh, so thanks for doing this. Um, and lovely to see so many faces on a Thursday night in Tucson. Uh, it feels on the cusp uh, before we're all about to um, be very, very hot together. And so thanks for this moment of coolness that we get to share. We are cool. We're here at a poetry reading on Thursday at the Poetry Center. So my name is Tyler. I work here as the director of the Poetry Center. It's a great pleasure to welcome everybody. Uh, and so thank you so much for coming. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Jane Hirschfield back in Tucson. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, Jane and I were talking earlier about that we need to do this more frequently. So uh, we'll have her back again soon. Uh, I'm really thrilled that she's here now to share work with us um, from amazing uh, recent work and, and, and all the way back throughout her whole over. And so we're so grateful. Um, she brought two very beautiful broadsides to the Poetry Center as a gift. And so if you have a chance to come visit us at the Poetry Center, please ask to see them. Both are poems from her most recent collection of book and their beautiful treatments uh, in broadside format. The title poem, Ledger, and then uh, the poem, uh, also, Let Them Not Say. Um, and they're both beautifully um, presented in the broadside format. So I hope you'll come and check that out. Um, a couple of things I want to say very quickly, uh, just about upcoming programs at the Poetry Center. Um, if there are children in your life, your own or others, and you might like to bring them to a poetry-themed event or program, on the 22nd of this month of, uh, of April, we'll have the return of our Kids Create program where we turn the entire library over to kids uh, for most of the day. And so uh, it's a wonderful experience and it's especially targeted for kids who are um, infant up to age 10. Um, and we will have a performance at that time from the theatrical group Stories That Soar. So if you know that group, it's a really exciting time and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and so that's on the 22nd, back here at the Poetry Center at 10 a.m. I hope you'll come join us and bring some children with you. Um, there's a brand new exhibit at the Poetry Center right now called Cut and Paste. And it's an exhibit that features the work of zines, zine culture, and zine making. And it's a really wonderful exploration of that form and the work that happens in that space. And there's so many great creators here in Tucson who are using that, that form and those materials. And this, this exhibit tells some of that story as well as broadly how that fits in the culture of zine making in the country. And so please come see that as well. That's available while the Poetry Center is open. Our last reading of the season with visiting writers will be on the 27th of the month of this month. And that will feature, that's the Distinguished Visiting Writer Series in partnership with the MFA program. And it will feature the writers Jennifer Elise Forrester and Michael Wasson. And that's here at seven o'clock at the Poetry Center. Uh, again, the 27th um, back here, free and for all of you. I'd love to see you back in this space. Books are for sale after the reading over here uh, inside. And so there are still some left. I know a lot of them have been sold already. So if you're interested in purchasing a book afterwards, we hope that you will. Jane is happy to sign them after the reading. Uh, and we request that you might wear a mask when you come into the signing line. And so if you need a mask or don't have one, we have some more that are available over at the book sales table. And that will help us and support Jane as she's doing a lot of traveling right now. We want to keep everybody safe and supported. So thanks for doing that. It's again, a really a big thrill to have Jane back here in Tucson and to help introduce her. Uh, we have another wonderful uh, poet and presenter to help, um, to help do that work. And I'm really excited to ask the poet and essayist, Catherine Larson, to come up to the podium now. Um, Catherine's book, Radial Symmetry, her poetry book, was a Yale Younger Poets pick uh, and a new collection of essays that's titled Wedding of the Foxes. Did I get that right? Yeah, good. Wedding of the Foxes uh, is just being submitted. Final edits are happening. Uh, a book of essays uh, with milkweed editions. So it will be out uh, in the next maybe year, year and a half. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome up Catherine Larson. Thanks so much, Catherine. Good evening. Welcome to the Poetry Center, and thank you so much for being here. It is my great pleasure and true honor tonight to introduce the award-winning poet, essayist, and translator, Jane Hirschfield. 
She is the author of 10 poetry collections, including Ledger, The Beauty, Come Thief, and Given Sugar, Given Salt. We're very excited to hear her read tonight from her upcoming 10th collection, The Asking New and Selected Poems, which will be out this September and is available by pre-order now. Hirschfield is also the author of two exquisite essay collections, Nine Gates, Entering the Mind of Poetry, and Ten Windows, How Great Poems Transform the World. She's also edited and co-translated three books collecting the work of women poets from the past, an anthology with Robert Bly and The Heart of Haiku, a book that explores the essence of haiku and its 17th century founding poet, Matsu Basho. Her many awards include fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Academy of American Poets, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She'll be reading tonight from a range of work over time, including The Ink Dark Moon, her co-translation of two foremost women poets of classical age Japan, poems written a thousand years ago, and some new poems from the asking new and selected poems, which draws from our previously published books of poetry, most recently The Beauty and Ledger. It's really a thrilling reading list. Hirschfeld's poems flourish in the liminal space where scientific inquiry, empathetic knowing, aesthetic experiment, and astute observation meet. A poem about the dwindling numbers of Siberian tigers and red-legged egrets juxtaposes the sound of heavy furniture being moved upstairs, a symbol of extinction's invisible yet oppressive weight. Doubt, hunger, and longing are interrogated as intimate companions. Rapture and paradox are inextricably linked in a poem, Bells Tolling on All Souls Day in Italy. Slipping easily between the intimacy of the quotidian and the expansiveness of the philosophical, Hirschfeld's poems seek to house a world in which perception can be delicately distilled, where the surreal can flash with clarity where the luminous carries undercurrents of anguish, and where the precision of observation is held in tender awareness with the imprecisions of human nature. Nobel laureate Czesław Miłosz wrote of Hirschfeld's profound empathy for the suffering of all living beings. And indeed, we see Hirschfeld's poems grapple with the powers of poetic imagination, as well as the realization of the human capacity for both profound connection and ecological destruction. The poet Jules Supervielle once wrote about decanting his deepest poetry only by dint of simplicity and transparency, seeing to it that the ineffable becomes familiar at the same time it guards its fabulous origins. Like Supervielle, Hirschfeld makes, makes use of poetry's seeing. Her poems are luminous windows and gates and doors, which peering through or stepping into, one can encounter a thrumming, vibrant, communicative intelligence. They are modes of inquiry, invested in possibilities and awakening perception. They invite us to notice our entanglements with one another and with the species around us. They call us to think, feel, and imagine more expansively. Please join me in welcoming the visionary Jane Hirschfield. I cannot thank you all enough for coming to this magnificent center for poetry, one of the best places in the country and the world for poetry. Um, <laughs> And for that magnificent introduction, thank you. Tyler, Paola, Diane, um, OG, Allison, um, you know, this, this, this evening and this house of literature have been made by so many hands. And I'm so happy to be back. Um, and now I have to fulfill what I thought I was going to do. I can't run out of time because you have been promised all these things. Um, 
So I'm going to begin with one earlier poem. I wanted to honor that it is National Poetry Month. And one of the things, I often start readings with this poem because what I want to acknowledge is how often there must be poets working in languages we'll never see, in places where perhaps there might be no chance of publication at all, places that wouldn't be translated into English, uh, everywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, there is someone writing a poem that changes all of our lives, whether we see it or not, and this poem uh, is to remember that. The Poet. She is working now in a room not unlike this one, the one where I write or you read. Her table is covered with paper. The light of the lamp would be tempered by a shade where the bulb's single, where the bulb's single harshness might dissolve. But it is not. She has taken it off. Her poems, I will never know them though they are the ones I most need. Even the alphabet she writes in, I cannot decipher. Her chair, let us imagine whether it is leather or canvas, vinyl or wicker. Let her have a chair, her shadeless lamp, the table. Let one or two she loves be in the next room. Let the door be closed, the sleeping ones healthy. Let her have time and silence, enough paper to make mistakes and go on. So I don't really write clappers, and it's okay to wait until the end, um, really. Um, because I know, you know, not every poem evokes Clapping, hollering, whooping, floor stamping, no. Um, so, so you don't, please don't feel obliged. I take silence as a high compliment, whether it's deserved or not. Um, <laughs> so I thought again, you know, both in honor of National Poetry Month and the lineage of poets that the Tucson Poetry Center honors so deeply and that we are all part of, I'm going to start with a few of the translated poems from the Japanese women a thousand years ago. I could spend the whole uh, evening talking about them and reading their work, and I must not do that. Um, so, you know, The Ink Dark Moon is the name of the book. If you want to know more about the background and more of their poems, um, it's, I'm sure, in the library. So this first set of poems is by uh, Onono Komachi, who lived in the ninth century uh, and served at the court of Heian-era Japan. The only example we have in world history until uh, recently, a great golden age created by women writers. They, were, they wrote much of love, they wrote much of loss, and there is an underpinning of Buddhist uh, worldview in their work. All the poems are five lines long, tanka form, older than haiku, uh, uh, 31 syllables in the Japanese, but not in the English. Did he appear because I fell asleep thinking of him? If only I'd known I was dreaming, I'd never have wakened. This pine tree by the rock must have its memories, too. After a thousand years, see how its branches lean toward the ground. How invisibly it changes color in this world, the flower of the human heart. And the last one of hers, uh, I'm sorry I'm skipping all the stories, the stories help, but this one is uh, thought to have been from her old age when she was long gone from the court, an unrecognized 
crone living in a thatched roof leaking hut outside the city walls. Uh, but they sort of thought the old lady knew something about poetry. And meanwhile, Ono no Komachi as a poet was quite famous, but nobody knew it was her. This abandoned house shining in the mountain village. How many nights has the autumn moon spent here? The second poet in the book, Izumi Shikibu, uh, wrote around the turn of the millennium, around the year 1000. If any of you know the world's earliest novel, The Tale of Genji, uh, by Murasaki Shikibu, uh, they served at court at the same time. Shikibu is a title. It's basically could be translated as lady. Um, Lying alone, my black hair tangled, uncombed, I long for the one who touched it first. Why haven't I thought of it before? This body remembering yours is the keepsake you left. In this world, love has no color, yet how deeply my body is stained by yours. And I was thinking of stained glass windows. Um, stained is a, is a difficult word, but you know, dyed also has another connotation, and between the two I went for the stained glass windows. These are all co-translations done with a collaborator, uh, Japanese-born Mariko Aratani came to this country um, when she was 27 and also loved these early poems. Um, I wanted to give you one taste of the women's other side. They weren't always sitting around longing. Um, uh, so the men would come to the women's uh, home after dark. It was a time of great freedom for women, again, more so than has been seen until you know 20th century culture. Um, the men would come. They would have exchanged poems, which would have told them whether they were welcome or not to come. And uh, when they left before dawn, because there was a convention of secrecy, uh, poems would be exchanged afterwards as well. Uh, but in the case of this poem, it was Shikibu who went to her lover's home, and this was the poem that she wrote. Returning home near dawn after a night away. I used to say, how poetic, but now I know this dawn rising men do is merely tiresome. <laughs> this one is quite certainly a poem of Buddhist understanding. Um, the moon in Japanese poetry can mean many things. It can mean the fullness of something, but it can also be a, an image of Buddhist awakening. I cannot say which is which. The glowing plum blossom is the spring night's moon. So a poem about no separation between uh, awakening and the transient beauty of any moment. I'll just give you a last poem by her. Um, I'm sorry, I, I really would like to spend the whole evening um, reading their poems. Uh, this one, uh, Shikibu is known, she would go to Buddhist monasteries and practice, there are poems about that. And this is the one which, according to legend, was supposed to have been written on her deathbed, sent to the priest who was her teacher. The way I must enter leads through darkness to darkness. O oh, moon above the mountain's rim, please shine a little further on my path. So that's a taste of thousand-year-old poems falling out of it. This is the original paperback. It just fell out of its cover. Um, so <laughs> here we go. When I was, this is my final reading, making up uh, uh, an event that was missed because of the pandemic. 
And so when I was originally scheduled to come, my most recent book, Ledger, was newly published, and I was going to concentrate on that book. Um, and now there's already another one coming. Um, but I'll read you, you know, mostly now from Ledger and then a few of the newer poems. Uh, this book is not only about the crisis of biosphere climate extinctions, um, but it is greatly about that. And it has an opening poem. I had been writing about these things before this book. Um, you know, there's a poem called Global Warming that I wrote in 2004. Uh, but I wrote this poem. This was the first poem written after my last book was finished. And I listened to it, and it changed my work. It made the urgency of this subject matter step forward because I had to listen to my own poem. Uh, so it's called Let Them Not Say. Let them not say we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say they did not taste it. We ate. We trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. Let them not say we were drowned out by motorcycles. Um, <laughs> Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing, we did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised and it burned. This is a poem hoping to make itself meaningless. I'm hoping that this is not what they will say. There's a rhetorical term for that kind of poem, apotropaic, um, a spell against its own existence. Um, this poem is titled The Bowl. You can think of any kitchen bowl, that would be fine. If you happen to think of the begging bowl carried by uh, Buddhist monks in traditional cultures where uh, they go from household to household, and if their practice and contribution to the community is not found worthy, nobody puts any rice in their bowl and they go hungry. Um, there's also a small reference to a less blank film about Werner Erhardt that some of you might recognize and don't worry if you don't. The bowl. If meat is put into the bowl, meat is eaten. If rice is put into the bowl, it may be cooked. If a shoe is put into the bowl, the leather is chewed and chewed over, a sentence that cannot be taken in or forgotten. A day, if a day could feel, must feel like a bowl. Wars, loves, trucks, betrayals, kindness, it eats them. Then the next day comes, spotless and hungry. The bowl cannot be thrown away, it cannot be broken. It is calm, uneclipsable, rindless, and big though it seems, fits exactly in two human hands. Hands with ten fingers, fifty-four bones, capacities strange to us, almost past measure. Scented, as the curve of the bowl is, with cardamom, star anise, long pepper, cinnamon, hyssop. I rather like the permeability of this room because so many of my poems are about, in one way or other, another, um, remaining perme permeable to the suffering of the world. And you know, every time I hear a siren, it's either an ambulance or a fire truck probably, somebody is having a bad moment when we hear a siren. 
uh, this poem Catherine referred to in her introduction. As if hearing heavy furniture moved on the floor above us. As things grow rarer, they enter the ranges of counting. Remain this many Siberian tigers, that many African elephants, 300 red-legged egrets. We scrape from the world its tilt and meander of wonder as if eating the last burned onions and carrots from a cast iron pan, closing eyes to taste better the char of ordinary sweetness. So this next poem is really all over the map. It has lots of things in it, and because you only get to hear it once, you know, on the page you can reread things, but you're only going to hear it once, so I'm just going to warn you. We have um, the International Space Station in the title, we have evolution, we have the geomorphology of Florida, uh, we have the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs, uh, we have the civil war in Syria and terrorism in general. And at the end of the poem, this had been going on for years when I wrote it, and it is still in the news regularly now, the crisis of the refugees in the Mediterranean. Um, day beginning with seeing the International Space Station and a full moon over the Gulf of Mexico, and all its invisible fishes. None of this had to happen. Not Florida, not the ibis's beak, not water, not the horseshoe crab's empty body, and not the living starfish. Evolution might have turned left at the corner and gone down another street entirely. The asteroid might have missed. The seams of limestone need not have been susceptible to sand and mangroves. The radio might have found a different music. The hips of one man and the hips of another might have stood beside each other on a bus in Aleppo and recognized themselves as long-lost brothers. The key could have broken off in the lock and the nail can refused its lid. I might have been the fish the brown pelican swallowed. You might have been the way the moon kept not setting long after we thought it would, long after the sun was catching inside the low wave curls coming in at a certain angle. The light might not have been eaten again by its moving. If the unbearable were not weightless, we might yet buckle under the grief of what hasn't changed yet. Across the world, a man pulls a woman from the water from which the leapt from overfilled boat has entirely vanished. From the water pulls one child, another. Both are living, and both will continue to live. This did not have to happen. No part of this had to happen. So when I stepped off the plane and arrived here yesterday, I was wearing one of those vests with a lot of pockets in it, which I discovered is the perfect way for a woman not to have to carry a purse. Um, and I'd been you know, traveling around wearing that vest for quite a few years. And one day I looked at it, you know, hanging over the chair in my room, as, as it often is, and it became a poem. Um, and, Thus it is. You look at something 110 times and the 111th, it suddenly says, ah, oh, I have something to say. Vest. I put on again the vest of many pockets. It is easy to forget which holds the reading glasses, which the small pen, which the house keys, the compass and whistle, the passport. To forget at last for weeks, even the pocket holding the day of digging a place for my sister's ashes. The one holding the day where someone will soon enough 
put my own. To misplace the pocket of touching the walls at Auschwitz would seem impossible. It is not. To misplace for a decade the pocket of tears. I rummage and rummage. Transfers from Munich, from Melbourne to Oslo. A receipt for a Singapore copy. A device holding music. Bach, Garcia, Richter, Porter, Pert. A woman long dead now gave me when I told her I could not sing a kazoo. Now in a pocket. Somewhere a pocket holding a Steinway. Somewhere a pocket holding a packet of salt. For Hazian vest, Oxford English dictionary vest with a magnifying glass tucked inside one snap closed pocket, Wikipedia vest, Rosetta vest, Enigma vest of decoding. How is it one person can carry your weight for a lifetime, one person slip into your open arms for a lifetime? Who was given the world and hunted for tissues for chapstick? I wanted to be surprised. To such a request, the world is obliging. In just the past week, a rotund porcupine who seemed equally startled by me. The man who swallowed a tiny microphone to record the sounds of his body, not considering beforehand how he might remove it. A cabbage and mustard sandwich on marbled bread. How easily the large spiders were caught with a clear plastic cup surprised even them. I don't know why I was surprised every time love started or ended, or why each time a new fossil, earth-like planet, or war, or that no one kept being there when the doorknob had clearly. What should not have been so surprising, my error after error, recognized when appearing on the faces of others. What did not surprise enough, my daily expectation that anything would continue, and then that so much did continue when so much did not. Small rivulets still flowing downhill when it wasn't raining, a sister's birthday. Also, the stubborn, courteous persistence that even today, please means please. Good morning is still understood as good morning. And that when I wake up, the window's distant mountain remains a mountain. The borrowed city around me is still a city and standing. It's alleys and markets, offices of dentists, drugstore, liquor store, Chevron. It's library that charges a happy surprise, no fine for overdue books. Borges, Baldwin, Zimborska, Morrison, Kavafi. So since that's one library reference in the book, and there's one other that I thought I'd read you since we are um, adjacent to one of the great libraries, Library book with many precisely turned down corners. I unfold carefully the thoughts of one who has come before me. The way a listening dog's ears may be seen lifting to some sound beyond its person's quite understanding. Words. Words are loyal. Whatever they name, they take the side of. As the word courage will afterward grip just as well the frightened girl soldier who stands on one side of barbed wire, the frightened boy soldier who stands on the other. 
death's clay. They look at each other with wide open eyes. And words that love peace, love gossip, refuse to condemn them. I was in Syria in 2007 with a small group of American writers traveling through a few countries in the Middle East. That was before the Civil War. The war in Iraq was raging. Syria had taken in 750,000 refugees, but it was a perfectly functioning police state uh, when I was there. And not that long afterwards, the Civil War broke out. And I thought about all those university students we had spoken to. And to this day, I am haunted by what must have become of their lives, whatever became of their lives. Um, this poem is thinking about there was a woman anesthesiologist who helped guide our little group around because you needed a woman to take women into the women's entrance of the, as she pronounced it, mosque, um, the mosque. Uh, she did, with her college-age son, um, escape early to Paris, and she now, she worked first for Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, and now she works for the UN uh, HCR. So um, I think about her a lot. She breathes in the scent. As the front of a box would miss the sides, the back, the grief of the living misses the grief of the dead. It is like a woman who goes to the airport to meet the planes from a country she long ago lived in. She knows no passenger, but stands near as they exit, still holding their passports. She breathes in the scent of their clothes. So this will um, change the mood a bit. Uh, you know, when we come here, we are always asked to pick some book from the shelves and recommend it. Um, because I knew I would be reading, and it's an impossible task, because I walk through those shelves and I see so many books that I would love to stop and sit down for three days and only read that book, and you know, book after book after book. But I decided that my recommendation would be a, a big selected poems by the Norwegian poet Olaf Hauge, because I knew I was going to read this poem tonight. Uh, so it comes not from a quote from one of his poems, but from you know those little biographical notes they put uh, in anthologies and things. So there was this sentence about him. Um, he spent his whole life in Ulvik working as a gardener in his own orchard. And somehow that struck me. Um, and so, by the way, um, Robert Bly visited Hauge in Norway and said that on this little eight acre apple farm uh, where he lived was the best poetry library in the country. Um, so, in Ulvik. I too would like to work as a gardener in my own orchard. Every Friday, I would pay myself a decent living wage take an enfoldable cash from my own wallet. And sometimes, if the weather was bad, I would give myself the day off and thank myself for my kindness and answer myself, it's nothing, nothing, go on now, put your feet up, find somewhere warm. And then I would go back into my house and think of my kindness and wonder if my gardener was warm now also and if I was right to let myself go away from my own orchard's tending even so briefly. And each of us might be thinking too of the apples, cold and wet and hanging in outside wind and fattening on their own trees without us. And one of us first, then the other, might start to wonder a little while pushing a cut of cured apple wood into the fire about loneliness and separateness and what it is lives outside one person's skin and inside another's.
like others. In the end, I was like others, a person, sometimes embarrassed, sometimes afraid. When fire was shouted, some ran toward it, some away, I neck deep among them. So I am going to come back now to the environmental theme that runs through the book. Um, I'm not going to read you the title poem. I will read you this small poem, which um, was remembering uh, many years ago, we all learned about the butterfly effect, which you know says a butterfly flaps its wings in uh, Africa, and there is an enormous storm in China some months later as a result. Uh, so that was what sits behind this. No wind, no rain. No wind, no rain. The tree just fell as a piece of fruit does. But no, not fruit, not ripe, not fell. It broke. It shattered. One cone's addition of resinous cell sap, one small-bodied bird arriving to tap for a beetle, it shattered. What word, what act was it we thought did not matter? And that actually did happen, you know, a still sunny day and an enormous old pine tree just came down hard for no perceptible reason. Um, so this poem is called On the Fifth Day. It was written on the fifth day of the last presidency, which was the day that the White House took down from its website um, all information about climate change, and every scientist who worked for the federal government was told not to speak about their research to the public unless it was approved by the political head of their administration. Um, I took this a bit personally. A lot of my closest friends are research scientists. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air. And the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers, and only the wind that spoke of its bees. While the unpausing, factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit, the silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stalkers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, jealous, kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. Okay, I'm going to read you one set of relatively mostly short poems from this and then a couple of, of the newer poems. Um, so it is very important to me, even as I have become a poet of more public engagement, um, I ended up reading that last poem on the Washington Mall at the 2017 March for Science to something like 40 or 50,000 people. Um, which was a very strange experience because when I talked about the bees, a whole crowd of people in bees suits started jumping up and down and waving their signs and yelling. And when I talked about the Badlands, that actually did happen. Scientists were tweeting facts from the Badlands. From deep in the crowd, there came this roar, and I thought, oh, that's where the Badlands contingent must be. Very odd. Um, but it is equally important to me 
that poetry continue to address the private life, the individual heart, interiority, the griefs that come to every human being of every kind sooner or later in this life. And so I will give you um, a set of poems that were precipitated by uh, a diagnosis of glioblastoma and three-year-long illness and eventual death of um, someone I had known all my adult life. Uh, some of the poems speak more towards his dying. Some of them speak more about anyone's mortality, my own mortality. Um, uh, they all but the last start with the words little soul. That's taken from the one poem we have by the Roman emperor Hadrian, who wrote a beautiful little poem on his deathbed in which he called his own departing life, Little Soul. Um, and the title of this first one, Amor Fati, is the Latin phrase, you know, love of fate, uh, whatever your life is, embrace, embrace it because it is your life. Amor Fati. Little soul, you have wandered lost a long time. The woods all dark now, birded and eyed. Then a light, a cabin, a fire, a door standing open. The fairy tales warn you, do not go in. You who would eat will be eaten. You go in, you quicken. You want to have feet, you want to have eyes, you want to have fears. Snow. Little souls, little soul, for you too, death is coming. Was there something you thought you needed to do? Snow does not walk into a room and wonder why. Kitchen. Little soul, how useful was hunger. From whatever it was we fell into, you and I, it sprang open our fingers' grip. Yet a life is not prepared for its ending like a sliced eggplant, salted and pressed to let leave from itself what is bitter. Harness. Little soul, you and I will become the memory of a memory of a memory. A horse released of the traces forgets the weight of the wagon. Rust flakes on wind. Little soul, a day comes when retrospection ceases. A person falling does not mid-plummet look up. Still, for a few seconds on Wednesday, where are my truck keys? On Thursday, on Sunday, where are my truck keys? Pelt. Little soul, the book of your hours is closing over its golds, its reds, your gazing dog, your rivers, ladders, ribcage. A life turns into its patterns and perfumes, then into its pelt. I don't know now if we were one, if we were two, a stippling. Whither thou goest, we'd said. Wood, salt, tin. Little soul, do you remember? You once walked over wooden boards to a house that sat on stilts in the sea. It was early. The sun painted brightness onto the water, and wherever you sat, that path led directly to you. Some mornings the sea road was muted, scratched tin. Some mornings blinding. Then it would leave. Little soul, it is strange. Even now, it is early. And the last in this series, 
I said. I said, I believed a world without you unimaginable, now cutting its flowers to go with you into the fire. Tin. So now we're into the, the new books, new poems. Um, tin. I studied much and remembered little. But the world is generous. It kept offering figs and cheeses. Never mind that soon I'll have to give it all back. The world, the figs. To be a train station of existence is no small matter. It doesn't need to be Grand Central or Hyder Pasha Station. The engine shed could be low, windowed with coal dust under a slat shingled roof. It could be tin, another mystery bandaged with rivets and rubies, leaking cold and heat in both directions as the earth does. Don't worry about this huge stack you see in my hands. I'm only reading a very few. I can see you looking alarmed. Will I ever have dinner? Um, you will. <laughs> um, so manifest is an interesting word in that, of course, it means you know made visible, but it also means the list of cargo in a ship. Um, and that's what it will come to in this poem. Manifest. Hawks, rivers, Cities, ochre, us. A species whose right hand sketches its left hand, but can't draw itself. Whales, geosynchronous satellites. A truck hauling folded tarps under a tarp. Wars, hunger, jail cells. Praises, pratfalls, puns. Gold circuits on phone card connectors. All cargo manifest, circling the sun together each 365 days plus a few remnant hours. A story here ribboned with lightning, there dimmed by clouds. On a nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and dust cushioned bundle whose glaciers depart Insects quiet, seas rise. To that which is coming, I say, here, take what is yours. But forget, if you can, what is coming. Find not worth pocketing. Let fall unnoticed as weed seed one small handful of moments and gestures. Moments mouse-colored, minor. Gestures disturbing no one slipped between the ones that were counted, the ones in which everything happened. A petroglyph's single fingerprint, a spider awake in an undusted corner. Let's stay, if you can, what is coming. One or two musical notes hummed in a half hour that couldn't be herded or mined made to save daylight or spend it. Leave one unfraudulent hope, one affection like curtains blown open in wind, whose minutes, seconds, fragrance, choices won't sadden the heart to recall. So this poem, like some number of poems in American poetry, had its genesis in the Tuesday Science Times page. Um, there was this glorious article on July 29th, 2020, about mosses in the Mojave Desert. And especially online, the images were, were fantastic. Um, so this poem is called Mosses. And you know, since we're 
Uh, I don't know about the desert here, but I bet if these mosses live in Mojave Desert, they live here. Mosses. For hypolithic mosses, it seems, 4% of daylight is right. They live, the headline says, by sheltering under a parasol of translucent quartz. The crystal scatters the light's ultraviolet, dilutes its heat, traps the night's condensed moisture to moss-sized rain. I think of these mosses and consider. Perhaps we too are mosses, evolving to the parch of our self-made Mojaves, unable to bear the full brightness, the full seeing, to recognize fully the Amazon burning, the Arctic burning, the monarch's smoke-colored missing migration. An experiment not meant to last. And yet we found shelter within it. We pondered our lives and the lives of others, thirsted, slept. To the implausible green of existence, for better, for worse, we offered our 4% portion of praises. For better, for worse, our 4% portion of comprehension. Thank you very much. Jane, thank you so, so, so much. Thank you. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> Take a second to congratulate your neighbor. You've all made a great choice for your Thursday night. Good work, everybody. It's nice to see everyone in Tucson here. Thanks for coming. Books are for sale. Please come up. Jane will sign them. Please use a mask when you come up to get your book signed. Again, our next reading in the series is the 27th. Jennifer Elise Forrester and Michael Watson. Hope to see you again soon. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>